Network show. It's Wednesday, uh, January 26, 2022. And we are live. We're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, uh, the Future Radio. So this uh, story that came out today dealing with the U.S. Supreme Court, um, the longest serving uh, Supreme Court Justice, Jeff Stephan Breyer, is going to retire at the end of this term. The new term starts up um, October 3rd, 2022. This sets it up for uh, President Joe Biden to nominate the first African-American uh, Supreme Court justice. Uh, Stephen Breyer to retire from Supreme Court paving way for a uh, Biden appointment. NBC News reported today. Also, that the first story I, I saw about this was from uh, National Public Radio, NPR.org. Uh, we posted that article also uh, on our Facebook fan page, uh, the African History Network from uh, National Public Radio. Uh, the liberal justice's decision to step down after more than 27 years on the court allows the president to appoint a successor who would uh, serve, who could serve for decades. So we're going to talk about some uh, uh, who are some of the front r- runners like um, uh, Judge Katanji uh, Brown Jackson, uh, who's on the uh, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, if we look at this piece here from the uh, NBC News, uh, Justice, Bri- Justice, Justice Stephen Breyer will step down from the Supreme Court at the end of the current term, according to people familiar with uh, his thinking. Now, President Joe Biden and, and Stephen Breyer are scheduled to appear together at the uh, White House on Thursday as the Supreme Court justice is set to announce his retirement, a source familiar with the matter confirmed uh, with NBC News. Now, Stephen Bry is one of the three remaining, is one of the three remaining liberal justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, and his decision to retire after more than 27 years on the court allows uh, President Biden to nominate the first African-American uh, female Supreme Court justice, but the split in the Supreme Court would still be a 6-3 majority conservative Supreme Court. It would still be a 6-3 majority uh, conservative Supreme Court. We know that uh, Donald Trump was there with the help of uh, Moscow Mitch McConnell, was able to get uh, three Supreme Court justices in uh, one term. Okay, Donald Trump was able to get three Supreme Court justices in one term. And if you go back to the 2016 uh, presidential campaign, this is what a lot of conservatives were saying was at stake in that election. They said this is about the Supreme Court and this is about the uh, the federal bench, federal court nominations. Okay, so Donald Trump got 226 federal judges confirmed also, which are lifetime appointments. Now, if we go back to this uh, piece here from uh, NBC News. So uh, at 83 years old, Justice Breyer is the court's oldest member. Uh, He was nominated in 1994 by uh, Bill Clinton. Okay, And liberal activists have urged uh, Justice Breyer for months to retire while while Democrats hold both the White House and the Senate because you need the Senate to confirm Supreme Court justices. A, a position that could change after the midterm elections. Hopefully it won't. They contended that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg stayed uh, on the bench too long, despite her history of health problems, and should have stepped down during the Obama administration so that President Obama could nominate a successor and keep Republicans from getting another Supreme Court justice because they stole one when uh, uh, Merrick Garland was blocked in 2016 by McConnell because because Republicans controlled the Senate after the uh, 2014 midterm elections. Now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, death from cancer at at age 87 allowed uh, um, Donald Trump to appoint her successor, Amy Coney Barrett, who was confirmed nine days before the 2020 presidential election took place moving the court further to the right and uh the the uh the the justice the, the federal bench seat that Amy Coney Barrett had prior to becoming a supreme court justice was a seat that was blocked by McConnell in 2016 when president Barack Obama nominated Myra Selby to the 7th circuit court of appeals we talked about this a couple of nights ago. Myra Selby is an African-American judge, African-American female judge, Myra Selby. 
in 2016, her nomination was blocked by McConnell. They did not give her a hearing. And what happened was when um, um, Donald Trump became president uh, through the Electoral College, because he lost the popular vote, when he became president, they then confirmed Amy Coney Barrett to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which is over Chicago. And she and Amy Coney Barrett got the uh, federal bench seat that was supposed to be for this African-American woman, uh, Myra Selby, okay, uh, who was nominated by uh, President Barack Obama. And uh, here's a picture of uh, Myra Selby here. It'll come up here in just a second. This is an article from um, news1.com. Um, never forget Myra Selby is the black woman is the black woman judge whose court seat was stolen for Amy Coney Barrett. This is from uh, news1.com. Okay, we're coming up here on the break. You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotep. We'll deal with this. We'll continue this another side of the break and we'll talk about uh, Alabama uh, as well. And uh, federal judge, uh, a federal court says Alabama's congressional map disadvantages African American voters. We'll be back in a few minutes. Soul in Motion, celebrating 38 years in the arts. This energetic ensemble of dancers and drummers was started by percussionist Michael Friend and is led by choreographer, associate director Pam Lassiter. Based in the Washington, D.C. area, Soul in Motion is now accepting bookings for Black History Month, Juneteenth, and summer festivals in 2022. Soul in Motion is also available for more intimate events like naming ceremonies and weddings. To find out more or book your date, call 240-452-1349 or send an email to info at soulinmotion.org. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Soul in Motion, celebrating our history, our culture, our future. Soul in Motion. Theater, African dance, and drumming since 1984. iRedify is a black-owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read eBooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Wednesday, January 26, 2022, and we are live. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. So right before the break, we were talking about one of the biggest uh, news stories uh, from today. And it deals with um, the oldest um, living, the oldest serving Supreme Court justice and the oldest uh, Supreme Court serving uh, Supreme Court justice, Justice Stephen Breyer, who is uh, going to retire at the um, end of this Supreme Court uh, term. He's going to serve out the term. Now, they don't have to wait to um, nominate and get a, a successor confirmed. We know the new Supreme Court term uh, starts up October 3rd, 2022. OK, so this uh, gives President Joe Biden the uh, opportunity to nominate the uh, nominate and get confirmed the first African-American Supreme Court uh, 
African-American female Supreme Court justice. We know uh, Lonnie Guineer was not nominated back in uh, under President Bill Clinton, but after a contentious um, after after a contentious uh, process and uh, being attacked by Republicans, her nomination was withdrawn. OK, so. Uh, 313-778-7600 is the call in number um, if you have a question or comment. OK, uh, I'm going to send this uh, these two clips to you, uh, Shakita. Uh, so I want to clip one from um, NBC News here in just a second. All right. So if you go back to this piece here from uh, uh, NBC News, and I posted an article from National Public Radio as well. Uh, that was the first story that I saw this morning from National Public Radio. Uh, so a lot of people have been calling on uh, Justice Breyer to step down. He's 83 years old. A lot of people have been calling on him to uh, step down now so that uh, Biden can nominate a successor and get a, a successor confirmed while Democrats control the Senate. OK, now, Biden said in uh, brief remarks to the press on Wednesday that he will leave it to Justice Breyer to formally announce the retirement uh, They are scheduled to announce the retirement on Thursday. Um, Justice Breyer and um, uh, President Biden are supposed to appear together to uh, announce the retirement. Uh, President Biden said, let him make whatever statement he's going to make. And I'll be happy to talk about it later. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki had earlier tweeted a statement saying it has always been uh, the decision of any Supreme Court justice if and when they decide to retire and how they want to announce it. And that remains the case today. Uh, the White House had no additional uh, details or information to share. Now, it was uh, we remember during the debates, it was. Um, um, President Joe Biden announced during the debates that he was going to nominate a African-American woman to the Supreme Court. It was Representative James Clyburn who pushed him to do that and pushed him to announce it, pushed him to announce it. Uh, Representative James Clyburn was interviewed today uh, with tonight on uh, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell show on MSNBC and talked about this. OK that he, he pushed them to uh, announce it publicly, all right? Now, I wanna go to uh, clip number one, then we're gonna go to the clip from the readout today that deals with who are some of the top candidates. Uh, let's go to uh, clip one. This is Lester Holt from uh, uh, NBC News announcing uh, the breaking news today. Let's go to clip number one, Shakita. Okay, well, um, just press play when it's when it's ready. Now, um, Erwin Sherminsky, dean of the uh, University of California Berkeley School of Law, urged Justice Breyer to retire in a Washington Post op-ed uh, article in May. Okay. Breyer will step down as a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court at the end of his current term. That's according to sources close to the justice. The 83-year-old is the oldest justice on the conservative 6-3 court. He's also the most senior member of its liberal wing, appointed by President Bill Clinton and has served since 1994. In the past year, progressive activists and some Democratic members of Congress have called upon Breyer to resign to make way for a new Biden nominee while Democrats control the Senate. We want to go right now to Justice Correspondent Pete Williams, who's breaking this news for us. Pete, what do you know? Well, according to people who are familiar with the justices thinking, and we should clarify, we have not heard from Justice Breyer directly, but according to people that he has talked to, He's made this decision within the past couple of weeks to step down and has told the White House they're fully prepared now to uh, to take the next steps that will follow. And as you said, Lester, uh, he has been repeatedly urged during the past term 
to step down while Democrats control both the White House and the Senate so that his nominee can be confirmed while the Democrats are still in control to maintain the current six to three split on the court, six conservatives to three liberals. And that's what his retirement would do. Now, according to the people we have talked to, several officials who are familiar with his thinking, his intention is to retire at the end of this term. Sometimes when justices step down, they say they will retire at the point where their successor is confirmed. But apparently what Justice Breyer has decided to do, according to people who are familiar with his thinking, is that he would step down at the end of this contentious term, which, of course, will be dominated by the issue of abortion with the question of Roe v. Wade very much before the court, gun rights, religious freedom, and many other hot-button issues in this current term. So it will still be a barn burner of a term for the justice. 28 years on the Supreme Court as one of the court's uh, dependable liberal votes, although he sometimes votes with the conservatives when it comes to issues of administrative law, in which he's an expert. He's a former federal appeals court judge, served in Boston, originally born in San Francisco. And President Biden, Lester, has said that he is committed to nominating a black woman to the Supreme Court. And among the possible nominees, the names that have been thrown around are uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, who is a former Breyer law clerk and is a federal judge here in Washington, and Leonda Kruger, who is a justice on the California State Supreme Court. As you noted, he came to the Supreme Court in 1994. He's been 28 years on the court. Uh, and there was lots of speculation that he would step down at the end of last term. He said he would not, that he wanted to stay on the court, that he was concerned that in that environment, if he were to step down, it would make the court appear to be too political. And apparently he's made a decision now that enough time has, has uh, passed that it won't be perceived that way. So we expect that an official announcement will come within the next uh, day or so, Lester, uh, and that then the process will begin of trying to find someone to succeed him. Pete, I want to clarify this timing a little bit. You say the end of the term. When I think of the end of the term, I think of October. But, of course, the court usually takes a break in, in the early summer. So do we have a uh, – I guess, I guess the point being the midterm elections loom large here. Well, yes, you're right. As a formalistic matter, the – uh, one Supreme Court term doesn't end until the next one begins, and the new ones always begin the first Monday in October. But as a functional matter, the term really ends in June. And I think that's the expectation here, that he would step down from the court at the end of the term, at the end of the, when the court is finishing, uh, finished handing down decisions in either late June or early July. Okay. All right. So we'll pause right there. Now, they can um, get a they don't have to wait until the end of the term to confirm a successor. They need to go ahead and do it as, as uh, sooner than later. The reason why is, is because um, when you have, so you have, I think it's still seven Democratic senators who are in states that have Republican governors. If something were to happen to one of those senators and they have to resign or what have you or untimely pass or something like that, like um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away or uh, former Senate, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid just passed away, uh, we, even though he had retired from the Senate. A lot of people don't realize that um, the governor can if so if you have a situation where you have a democratic senator and a democratic senator has to resign or something like that the governor can put a republican in that position and what that will do is flip the senate 51 49 republican and mitch mcconnell becomes senate majority leader this is why a lot of these people on social media, like this dumbass I just blocked, who has no clue what they're talking about. This is why people like that have no clue what they're talking about. They don't understand what's at stake. Republicans do. That's why you had many Republicans in 2016. Donald Trump was not their first, second, third, fourth or fifth choice. But they said they're going to vote for Trump because they said this is about the Supreme Court and this is about federal judge nominations. This is about the Supreme Court and the federal bench, which are lifetime appointments. 
And because and because white people have a declining population in this country, you have conservatives that want to control the federal bench because the judiciary branch of the government interprets law from the legislative branch of the government and interprets policies from the executive branch of the government, like executive orders. They understand this, and many of our people don't. We'll continue this on another side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skincare and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry, it's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Network show we do with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts. You control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. <laughs> 910, The Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 910 AM, The Superstation, The Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Wednesday, January 26, 2022, and we are live. Calling numbers 313 778 7600. 313 778 7600 is calling number if you have a question or comment okay uh you can still register for the online classes i teach on saturdays and sundays uh saturdays it's from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 this is a 10-week online course that i teach we do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips um etc and uh, we do that 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time uh visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com and then on Sundays, it's ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school, okay? And we do that 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time also. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, we have a special bundle pack right now for a very limited time only. You can register for both classes for only $70. They're regularly $130 each. Also, uh, at our website, uh, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, Okay, email me at AHN show at African History Network dot com. AHN show at African American AHN show at African History Network dot com. We know uh, African American History Month is coming up. And um, also we have the uh, fifth uh, Michael M. Hotel 15 DVD Black History Month bundle pack 
at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. It has 15 of uh, my DVD lectures. All right. So right before the break, we were uh, dealing with the uh, news, dealing with the Supreme Court today. And uh, Justice uh, Breyer, Justice Stephen Breyer, 83 years old, is going to retire at the end of this term. And this sets it up for the uh, first African-American female uh, Supreme Court justice to be uh, confirmed. Um, I want to see here. OK, so National Public Radio has this story that you can check out also because we posted it uh, early today from National Public Radio. Justice Stephen Breyer, an influential liberal on the Supreme Court to retire. So check that article out uh, also from um, national NPR.org, National Public Radio. All right. I, I want to go to this uh, piece here from the readout with Joanne Reed. She talked about this um, today on the readout, and she talked with uh, attorney Ellie Mastal. Let's go to clip two, Shakita. readout tonight with a major opportunity for President Joe Biden to make a very powerful Washington institution a little bit more like America. The question of what kind of country we want to be is increasingly decided not by elected representatives of our multiracial democracy, but by appointed members of the Supreme Court. The biggest issues like reproductive rights and voting rights, protections for immigrants and the environment, and as we found out just this week, the future of affirmative action. And now President Biden will make his mark on the high court with the unexpected news that Associate Justice Stephen Breyer plans to retire at the end of his term. It's unexpected in the sense that Justice Breyer has refused to telegraph his intention, and it gives President Biden a rare opening on the nine-justice court. Not for an ideological switch. It's not going to change the fundamental makeup of the now six-to-three right-wing court. But it does give him the opportunity to fill that seat for decades to come and to make good on a major campaign promise. I'm looking forward to making sure there's a black woman on the Supreme Court to make sure we pass. Yeah. Not a joke. Not a joke. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the president stands by that pledge, but offered no specifics ahead of a formal announcement from Justice Breyer. But a host of names have already emerged as possible nominees. Among them, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, appointed to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals by President Biden last year to replace Merrick Garland. She was confirmed with the support of all 50 Democratic senators and three Republicans, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, and Lindsey Graham. Justice Leonora Kruger, an associate justice of the California Supreme Court, Judge J. Michelle Childs of the U.S. District Court for the District of South Carolina, Judge Leslie Abram Gardner of U.S. District Court for Georgia, and Cheryl and Eiffel, president of the president and lead counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. After the rampant Republican obstruction of President Obama's judicial nominees led to Harry Reid changing the filibuster rules, we should be prepared for a major political fight. Minority Leader Addison Mitchell McConnell III told Hugh Hewitt last year that he'd probably block any nominee if Republicans regain Senate control and a seat on the court opens up. If you were back as the Senate, and I hope you are, and a Democrat retires at the end of 2023 and they're 18 months, that would be the Anthony Kennedy precedent. Would they get a fair shot at a hearing, not a radical, but a normal mainstream liberal? Well, we'd have to wait and see what, what happens. That old Mitch wouldn't say anything today pending a formal announcement from Justice Breyer. But the usual suspects in his army of ghouls are gearing up for a fight. Lindsey Graham put out an almost shockingly factual statement, noting if Democrats hang together, which I expect they will, they have the power to replace Justice Breyer in 2022 without one Republican vote in support, adding elections have consequences. Yep. Happens to be true. Try to tell there was you. also insurrectionist fist pumping Missouri Senator Josh Hawley. He put out a statement, too, albeit a stupid one, saying expect a major battle and Biden should nominate someone who loves America. Huh. In other words, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer does have his work cut out for him. He says President Biden's nominee will get a hearing with deliberate speed. 
Justice Breyer, who was nominated by President Clinton in 1994 and has served for decades as a stalwart of the liberal wing, authoring rulings on abortion and the death penalty, among others, has yet to make it official. He's argued that justices should be loyal to the law and not to political parties. Democrats are aiming to confirm any Biden Supreme Court nominee, whoever it may be, on a similar time frame as when Republicans rushed through Justice Amy Coney Barrett's nomination just weeks before the 2020 election. She was confirmed in just 27 days. Mm-hmm. Joining me now, Ellie Mastal, Justice Correspondent for the Nation, Michael Bechloss, NBC News presidential historian and host of Fireside History on MSNBC's The Choice on Peacock, and Erin Carmone, senior correspondent for New York Magazine and co-author of the great book, Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I have missed you, Erin Carmone. I haven't seen you in many, many a year. Um, I miss you too. It's so great to see you. So I'm going to start with you. Um, you having been a great biographer of uh, the notorious RBG, uh, I wonder what you make of this opening um, and what Biden might do with it. Well, I think it's clear that Breyer, um, among many other things, looked to the tragic example of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, because of her decision not to retire in the Obama administration, and we can talk about what her reasons were, but she did not choose to do so while the Democrats controlled the Senate before 2014. Um, as you just mentioned, Amy Coney Barrett was rushed through against her stated wishes. Uh, Breyer not only can see that his dear friend and fellow justice uh, experienced that kind of undoing of her legacy uh, and the denial of her dying wish, he can also see that uh, he can read a poll just like anyone else. He served on the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee as lead counsel. He's a pragmatic political animal. Uh, he realizes that the clock is ticking, and certainly there were many progressive advocates willing to remind him that the clock was ticking and that he had an opportunity to, while it may not shape the ideological balance of the court, as you mentioned, he has the opportunity to make sure that his uh, leaving the court will not create greater damage. Because we know a 5-4 court was bad for progressives. We know a 6-3 court could do even more, and a 7-2 court no progressive wants to imagine. And, and, you know, Michael, if you could just sort of zoom us out here and talk about the historical context, because, you know, right, this isn't a change in the ideological makeup of the court, but it is a long-term change should, you know, President Biden nominate somebody really young um, that could serve on the court, you know, for 40, 50, you know, for 40 years or so, you know, or whatever, 30, 40 years. Um, So what does it mean, um, big picture, for Biden to have this chance? And what would it mean and what would it say about the Republicans if they try to fight it anyway or if some Democrats join them and try to block it. Well, I agree with you, Joy. The statement that was made by the senator from Missouri about appointing someone who loves the country, that was stupid and it was almost slanderous. Any president is going to do this, even a president that you may not uh, agree with. Shows how, how far our country has come. But, you know, this is, these have been milestones on the court in an American society. You know, it took until 1967, as you all know, for there to be a black person on the Supreme Court. LBJ chose Thurgood Marshall, and he actually created an artificial vacancy to do it, appointed Ramsey Clark as attorney general, which meant that Clark's father, who was a justice on the Supreme Court, had to get off and create a place for Thurgood. It's good for him. Reagan in 1981, Reagan didn't do everything right by a very long shot, but he did appoint the first woman to the Supreme Court. Why should taken two centuries. So here we have a case where Joe Biden has committed himself to put the first African-American woman on the Supreme Court. Should have happened a very long time ago. Court has to look like it. Yeah, indeed. And Ellie, you know, I think, okay. I think we pa- know pa- pa- what... Uh, pause it right there, Shakita. Meant, we, we're gonna, he said, uh, who pause loves it, America? Pause it right there. Just back it up about 20, 30 seconds. We're going to pick it up when we come back from the break with Ellie Mustall. Then we'll go to the phone lines. We'll go to uh, Big Joe. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself 
and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. Come and travel with me to a time long ago and place far away. You will experience high adventure and excitement. You are fighting alongside an ancient army in fierce battle. Feel the exhilaration of struggle and final conquest. My name is Maninkare and I am both a prince and a priest in one of the most advanced civilizations humans have ever produced. I want you to ride with me in my chariot as I slay the barbarians who have come to invade my land. I invite you to sit at the conference table with the great Pharaoh Taharqa and his ministers as they plan intrigue and use subterfuge to outmaneuver and defeat the enemy. Come back with me to the land of your ancestors, to the beautiful land of Kemet. So open the pages of this book and begin the adventure. Find out what happens in the book Maninkare Battles the Assyrians in the Nile Valley from author Makari Jones. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Hey, if you like this type of information, you support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, we also have the information uh, around the homepage of our website at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, our official Cash App account is dollar sign the AHN show, S H O W. When you go to it, it'll say Michael and show my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. All right. Um, I want to go back to this clip here. This is from the readout with Joanne Reed, uh, Wednesday, January 26, 2022. And it's dealing with um, Justice Breyer, uh, who's going to retire from the Supreme Court at the end of this term. And um, Joe Biden will nominate an African-American woman to be uh, Supreme Court justice. Let's go back to this clip, Shakita. Automatically, okay. you know, be called, you know, the human embodiment of critical race theory, and they're going to be gone after on issues that are very directly related to race. Um, the, the argument against them will be highly racialized um, by Republicans because by love America, they mean the uncritical of America's history when it comes to race and specifically when it comes to black people. That's how I read it. Uh, and I wonder what you make of this opportunity that Biden has and what he might do with it. And if you have any kind of tea leaves on who he might choose of this incredible list of, of uh, judges. I mean, look, first let's dispense with the qualifications argument. All of the women that are that are being bandied about right now are immaculately qualified, um, especially when you talk about, you know, or in particular when you talk about a Kentaji Brown Jackson, who's maybe the leader in the clubhouse right now. We're talking about a woman with a Harvard College degree, a Harvard Law degree, who has served as the head of the U.S. Sentencing Commission, who has been a long-term judge, who is sitting on the D.C. Circuit right now. You don't get more qualified than a Brown Jackson or Leandra Kruger or a Justice Child. You'll get more qualified. And quite frankly, of the 115 people who have served on the Supreme Court, 108 of them have been white guys. So maybe it's actually the other side that's just been looking for the best available white men around, whereas, whereas when, we look at, when we look at the more diverse and complexity of the country, we can find truly the most qualified candidate for the job. So we should have no issue about their qualifications. Who say nothing of their moral qualifications? Because I'm pretty sure, I don't know for a fact, but I am pretty sure that Joe Biden will not nominate somebody who has been credibly accused of, of trying to rape somebody when they were in high school. I am pretty sure, I don't know this for a fact, that Joe Biden will not nominate somebody who has been accused of perjury in front of Congress over a previous co confirmation hearing. So there's, there, there are the professional qualifications, but there are also the moral qualifications that, as far as I can see, every one of those black women that we've listed had. Okay, pause, 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 know, right, pause right there, Shakira. That point. Pause it right there. All right, let's go, let's go quickly to the phone lines. Let's go to Big Joe. Uh, we only got a couple of minutes left. Joe, go ahead quickly with your question or comment. Thanks for holding. Yes, my comment is that it's about time that an African-American woman be chosen for the Supreme Court. I argue with people all the time. 
and, and tell them that Obama had an opportunity in his first two years mm -hmm. to put an African-American in the Supreme Court. And it's about time Joe Biden promised that that would be his choice and he should be forced in a way to keep his word and put an African-American because she's earned her right. Right. Well, he doesn't have to be forced. Really? He, he doesn't have to be forced. Jen Psaki, White House press secretary today, said he's going to do it. So he doesn't have to be forced to do it. Yeah, I understand that. I heard that. I heard that something about that as well. But I'm just saying he should be, he should be solidified that he keep his word. Yeah. And do exactly what he said. Right. And you know, I'll be, I'll be totally elated that finally an African American woman who had had households where she was the breadwinner without a husband mm -hmm. and reared up children without a husband and have held the line for many a year is given the opportunity to be to serve on that Supreme Court. And right. we got one like Denise Page Hood. Mm -hmm. is, I ain't never heard her name, but she's, she's somebody that's qualified. It's a number of people that's qualified. Well, well, it's a number well, of them well, qualified. Yeah, well, 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 Joe, most yeah. likely, most likely it's going to be somebody who's already gone through the uh, confirmation hearings like uh, uh, Katanji Brown. She went through the confirmation hearing uh, July uh, 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 2021. I think it was June or July 2021. Most likely it's going to be somebody who's already been through the Senate confirmation hearing so that anything in their background has already gotten out. Okay. But, oh, okay. but yeah, but, th but, th but, th okay. but thanks for calling, man. Call back tomorrow. Call, call back tomorrow, Joe. We're out of time uh, today. Uh, th thanks for calling. Okay. Um, I'm going to squeeze this in quickly here. So the uh, Alabama, let's go to Alabama quickly. Uh, federal court says Alabama's congressional map disadvantages black voters, January 25th, 2022. This was a um, ruling that, that came down uh, Monday, uh, January 24th. OK, now a, a panel of federal court judges has blocked Alabama's new congressional map uh, drawn by Republican state lawmakers from taking effect. In an opinion released late Monday, January 24th, the judges sided with plaintiffs, including the ACLU of Alabama and the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, writing that under the map, quote, black voters have less opportunity than other Alabamians to elect candidates of their choice to Congress, end quote. Now, when crafting the maps last year, the GOP majority in the, in the uh, legislature drew just one majority black district, drew just one majority black district. If voting doesn't matter, why are Republicans doing this? If, if, it, if it doesn't matter, why are Republicans doing this? But according to uh, 2022 census, state population counts, 27% uh, of Alabama's residents identified as black or African-American. OK, now, therefore, the federal judges order that any map needs to include at least two black majority district districts. It needs to include at least two black majority districts quote, or something quite close to it, end quote, all right? Now, U.S. Uh, Representative Terry Sewell, African-American woman, a Democrat and the only uh, African-American member of Alabama's congressional delegation, called the news, quote, unquote, monumental. She said increasing political representation of black Alabamians is exactly what John Lewis and the foot soldiers who marched across the bridge in my hometown uh, hometown of Selma, Alabama, fought for, end quote. Now, State Attorney General uh, Steve Marshall says he plans to petition the decision to the U.S. Supreme Court in the coming days. State lawmakers have until February 11th, 2022, to come up with a new plan. Okay, so we'll talk about this uh, some more on, uh, on tomorrow's show. There's also a piece from uh, the Washington Post from um, the past couple of days from the Washington Post. Uh, black and la black and Latino voters have been shortchanged in redistricting advocates. And some judges say 
even as Democrats have fared better than expected in new maps, Republicans have chopped up minority communities in some states. This is from um, this is from January 25th. Put the date on here, Washington Post. You, you people, I pay y'all enough money to do it. You, you, you charge for subscriptions. You got enough money to put the date on there. Uh, this is from January 25th, 2022. Also, new congressional maps are completed in more than half the country. And so far, Democrats have been spared the redistricting losses they endured a decade ago, a small mercy for their efforts to cling to their fragile House majority. But advocates for voting rights say the raw political calculation overshadows another reality, how map drawers, drawers have manipulated the lines mostly at the expense of minorities, Latinos and, and African-Americans. OK, uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're going to continue for a couple more minutes. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Remember, right now, it's correct. It's wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll count it forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Stand by. OK, let's go quickly back to the story here. OK, this is from The Washington Post. Um, January 25th, 2022, Black and Latino voters have been shortchanged in redistricting advocates and some judges say. All right, in just a second here. Um, all right, where, where is that one? Okay, we'll come back to this here in just a minute. Let me change the uh, caption. All right, let's continue. Okay, let's go back to this story here. Essence Magazine also has a story dealing with uh, Alabama's congressional map also. Now, across the country, the white population has shrunk over the past decade. Now, this is this is the result of the U.S. Census. This is the result of the U.S. Census count. And the U.S. Census is connected to uh, how many seats in the House of Representatives each state has, which is then connected to um, how many uh, electoral college votes each state has. That's all connected to the census and population growth because uh, to determine how many seats in the U.S. House of Representatives a particular state has, you take the number of, I'm sorry, to, to determine how many electoral college votes each state has, you take the number of seats in the House of Representatives a state has, you add to that, the number of um, U.S. senators each state has. So each state based upon the U.S. Constitution has two U.S. senators. House of Representatives is based upon population and is based upon the results of the census that's taken every 10 years as stipulated by the U.S. Constitution. U.S. Constitution created the U.S. Census. First census was taken in 1790. So when you have a state or a district in, in, the, in the size of the district, the size of a congressional district is based upon the results of the last census. So based upon the 20, based upon the 2010 census, a congressional district consists of 710,000 people. With the 2020 census, you had some states that lost a congressional seat, which means they lost a seat, they, they lose one electoral college vote. For instance, the state of Michigan, where I am, we had 16 electoral college votes. Our population dropped. We lose, we lost one uh, congressional seat in the House of Representatives. So uh, we'll have uh, 15 electoral college votes. The state of Texas had an increase in population. They picked up two. Uh, House seats, and they picked up two electoral college votes, the state of Texas. The state of New York, uh, actually the state of New York, if they had um, 89 more people counted in the census, they would have retained the same number of uh, electoral college votes. 
in the same number of House seats. They lost one House seat in the House of Representatives because 89 more people were not counted for the state of New York in the 2020 census. This is how this this is how important this is. This is why Trump wanted the immigration question on the 2020 census form. And it hasn't been an immigration question on the 2020 census. Oh, there hasn't been an immigration question on the census in about 60 years or so. Because as stipulated by the U.S. Constitution, the uh, census is supposed to count everyone in the country who's here, regardless of whether, regardless of their status, regardless of whether they're here legally, undocumented, visiting on a visa, what have you. You're supposed to count everybody here in the country. Trump wanted to put the immigration question on the country to to suppress the count in states that lean Democratic because those states would tend to have more uh, immigrants and could possibly have undocumented immigrants for various reasons. Because a lot of people who are here undocumented came here legally and overstayed their visas. They were here legally, but that now they're here undocumented. Now they're here illegally because they overstayed visas. It's not that they came here illegally in the first place. They just overstayed visas. It's like if you, it's kind of like if you um, have a legal driver's license and your birthday comes and you don't renew your driver's license and you keep driving for the next two, three, four, five months. Okay. Well, or, you know, two months or whatever it is, you're, it's not like you never had a license. It's just that your license expired. You need to get it fixed, get your new tags, or you may be driving somebody else's car who has legal tags, but your license is, is expired. Well, it's not like you never had one. You, you just need to go get it renewed. So you have some people here who are classified as undoc undocumented they came here legally but overstayed their visas so the census is supposed to count everybody that's here in the u.s period regardless of status well trump wanted the the immigration question on the census to reduce because what this would do is you have some households where you have some people in the household who are here legally you have other people in the household who are here undocumented where well, they're less likely to send in the census information or send in the correct census information, et cetera. OK, so he did that on purpose to suppress the population count in states that lean Democratic so that they'll lose a population count and lose electoral college votes when it comes to the presidential election, because it's tied to populate electoral college votes are largely tied to population. Also, the census deals with the reallocation of $1.5 trillion in resources per year for 10 years. The U.S. Census deals with the reallocation of $1.5 trillion in government resources per year for 10 years. $1.5 trillion per year for 10 years. So when I when I hear people trying to downplay the significance of the census, I'm like, um, what are you talking about? Let me uh, pull this up here. Just one second. Uh, So if we just look at this here briefly, uh, challenging census results could mean more federal money for your community. January 5th, 2022, National Public Radio, NPR.org. Challenging census results could mean more federal money for your community. 
because you can challenge census, like the mayor could challenge census results of a city. How much federal money will your community get this year? It depends in part on how many residents were counted in the census. The once a decade tally of people living in the U.S. helped guide an estimated $1.5 trillion a year to local communities is $1.5 trillion per year for 10 years based upon the population count in the census. Some communities, however, have been concerned they won't get their fair share of, of Medicare, Medicaid, schools, roads, and other public services for the next decade because that's all tied to the census count. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties that adopted adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. And the census was created by the Constitution. The census is in the U.S. Constitution. For the 2020 census, counting efforts were not only delayed, but the coronavirus pandemic, by the coronavirus pandemic, but also cut uh, cut short by Benedict Donald, the trader in chief, Donald Trump, heightening worries of undercounts. Starting this week, tribal, state, and local officials can try to get their census results corrected through what the Census Bureau calls its count question resolution program. While it would not change the state numbers that have already been used to reallocate congressional seats and electoral college votes or the data used to redraw voting maps, it could provide a limited, uh, it could provide a limited remedy to some communities who want to challenge their official population counts because then that would uh, impact the federal funding that they get. Also, um, corporations and different things like this, chamber of commerce, what have you, they'll look at the census numbers to see where increases of population, uh, increases in populations are to determine where to put new businesses, factories, different things like this. The Bureau, the Census Bureau is also expected to roll out details in the coming months about other ways to contest data it's producing after an especially messy census, while at least one major city is considering taking the Census Bureau to court. From now through June 2023, the highest officials of tribal state and local governments can ask the census bureau to double check for any errors in processing data or setting borders that may have misplaced homes so read the rest of this article here this was updated january 5th 2022 challenging census results could mean more federal money for your community because politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. All right, now, if we go back to this, uh, quickly here to this article from the Washington Post, Across the country, white uh, the white population shrunk shrunk over the past decade as minority communities have swelled according to the 2020 census. Yet the rapid growth of Latinos and African Americans is not reflected in any of the new maps passed so far, except California's, which added five seats where except California's, which added five seats where Latinos, let me scroll back up here.
Okay, hold on. Where was that? Okay, except California's, which added five seats where Latinos make up the majority of the adults. Black majority districts decreased by five seats. Black majority districts decreased by five seats, while majority white districts grew by eight seats. According to a Washington Post analysis, looking at the 28 states that have completed congressional maps. There are more majority white districts in approved maps, despite white population stagnation in those states. In the 28 states that have finalized the congressional maps by Tuesday, uh, January 20, uh, Tuesday, January 25th, they are more majority white districts added than any other demographic majority okay so then uh okay so then it shows this breakdown here voting age population um white voting age population in from 2010 to 2020 basically stayed unchanged in 93 million For Hispanics, voting age population increased from 24.9 million in 2010 to 31.8 million in 2020. African American voting age population increased by 2 million from 16.5 million in 2010 to 18.5 million in 2020. Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander voting age population because Asians do vote. If you think Asians don't vote, that means you don't do research. That's not true. Asians do vote. And if you don't believe me, go to uh, NBC News. Or hell, you can go to Pew Research for that matter. Pew Research has the data. Go to NBC News. I love it when people just repeat nonsense that they hear from other people and don't do research. Go verify this information. Just repeat stupid ass nonsense. Um, go to NBC news and NBC news.com in the upper right hand corner, click on the three horizontal lines. Then it takes you to this menu here that shows the different platforms for M for NBC it shows you NBC, black NBC, Latino, NBC, Asian American. Then it takes you to the Asian American platform for NBC News that has all these articles dealing with the Asian American community. Okay. And it has information dealing with politics, voting, things like this as well, especially around election time. Okay. Uh, so you can go check this out. They have information there dealing with the 2020 uh, presidential election, all that stuff. All right. Um, let's see here. And if you scroll down, Asian American disabilities, all this dealing with Asian American communities is at NBCnews.com. So I, I, when I hear people say nonsense like this, I can tell they don't do research because that's just blatantly false. Now they may not vote in the same, same percentage as African Americans. Our history is entirely different. When you talk about Asian Americans, you're talking about people who come from like uh, at least 20 different countries and they speak different languages, have different histories, have different cultures. Some of them come from countries that don't, and they don't have a history of voting in those countries. OK, but that doesn't mean they don't vote just because they don't just because the, the percentage of voting age population that votes is much less than ours. Th their history is totally different. But. As their percentage population increases, and as they learn more, many different populations learn more about politics, they're voting in higher numbers. Uh, new guidelines could mitigate racial profiling of Asian academics, uh, officials say. 
So there's a lot of uh, I read a lot of these articles. That's how I, that's how I know this. Um, there was one. Let me see if we go to you can you can you can search for um, information dealing with the 2022 presidential election. And uh, I think they have a section that breaks it down by politics also. Because I know they have it up during the. um, Okay, that's U.S. News. I know they have it up during the um, presidential election. Okay, but you can you can explore that. This is one article here that breaks this down. This is from, I think, the 2022. In this uh, uh, 2020 presidential election, this was, uh, as I talked about this when this came out. Uh, let me see. Hold on. Where is that? Okay, not that one. Okay, so okay, this is from twenty eighteen. But this is from their Asian American platform. I'm just looking at articles I have bookmarked dealing with the, dealing with the Asian American community. So I'm in Firefox because I have thousands of articles bookmarked. This is one that I have bookmarked dealing with the Asian American community, which is a diverse community. You talk about talking about people coming from at least 20 different countries, South Korea, Japan, China, Thailand, um, you have uh, Vietnam. You, you're dealing with people coming from at least 20 different countries, speaking different languages, coming from different cultures. Asian American voter enthusiasm up despite little contact from parties. Survey finds this is from uh, 2018. This is from October 10th, 2018. Okay, the survey found that 58 percent of Asian American voters rated Democrats more favorably than Republicans. Uh, so you can go read this and then it, it connects you to other articles dealing with uh, on the um, Asian American platform, dealing with politics from uh, NBC News. OK, so, so that will get you started. And there was um, there was one video that broke this down. Uh, nearly 40 percent of Asian American voters don't favor a party. OK, now that's I think that's probably from about 2018. Uh, why the Latino, why the Latino and Asian American vote matters. Okay. That's from May 22nd, 2016. You can watch that video. Um, Asian American candidates bank on experience against first timers. Okay. That was during the midterm election, 2018. Okay. Follow NBC Asian America on Facebook and all this. Cause I, I get the updates from, um, dealing with the Asian American platform. Also, I follow NBC black also. Okay. But uh, you get that. Idea. Go research that. All right. Now. Uh, Thomas, you missed the beginning of the show. Okay. Go back and watch the beginning of the show. The, the, um, that you, you like missed a lot. You came, you came in late. I could tell by your comment. All right. Let's go back to this here. I can tell by your comment, you missed the majority of this show. Okay, let's go back to this here. Uh, okay, Washington Post. Asian American Pacific Islanders picked up three million um, um, 
people voting age population from 2010, 8.1 million to 11.2 million 2020. Other groups increased by about 4 million, 3.3 million in 2010 to 7.2 million in 2020. All right, and then they break down congressional districts with racial or ethnic voting age majority. So check that out as well. Now, judges have intervened in two states where Republican state legislators were accused by voting rights advocates of disenfranchising African-American voters. Judges have intervened in uh, two states where Republican state legislators were accused of voting, uh, voting rights advocates were accused by voting rights advocates of disenfranchising black voters in Alabama on Monday night, which was January 24, 2022, a panel of federal judges struck down a new congressional map that packed African-American voters into one of seven districts in a state where African-Americans account for 27% of the population. Okay, this is packing. This is one of the things that Republicans will do when they redraw district lines. They'll try to pack African-Americans into one or two districts or something like that to reduce the redraw district lines, try to pack them into one or two districts to reduce their ability to vote in different races. This is done with congressional uh, maps, congressional districts. This this does not affect U.S. senators. U.S. Senate races are statewide. Congressional races are in a district based upon the 2010 census. Is seven, the districts are broken up into groups of 710,000 people. OK, so if you live in like I live in the 14th congressional district, Brenda Lawrence. OK, I can't vote in the 13th congressional district. Is based upon zip code. It's based upon where you live. Okay, so this is what this is dealing with, dealing with congressional districts. This does not impact U.S. Senate races, which are statewide. Um, you live, regardless of where you live in the state, you can vote for the two U.S. senators. So the uh, the judges ruled that the legislature must draw a second congressional district in which African-American residents have, quote, an opportunity to elect a representative of their choice, end quote, an opportunity to elect an, a representative of their choice, end quote. The decision, which is certain to be appealed, follows another redistricting win for Democrats this month when the Ohio Supreme Court determined that the GOP-led uh, legislature had unfairly drawn the district lines to its partisan advantage. In both instances, the decision to invalidate the maps and send state legislators back to the drawing board could yield Democrats several more seats ahead of the November 2022 midterm election when control of Congress will turn on a handful of congressional races. Before states began, began drawing their lines in 2020, experts estimated that Republicans could gain enough seats in redistricting alone to overcome the current 10 seat advantage Democrats hold in the House of Representatives. Yet based on the 2020 presidential election results, based on the 2020 presidential election results, Democrats have made gains netting an additional five districts that President Joe Biden would have won. To be sure though, Democrats are not guaranteed wins in those seats in November. The party in the White House has historically lost ground in midterm elections. But this is the first president. This is the first midterm election that has taken place after an attempted insurrection since 1866. 
the year after the Civil War ended. This is not a typical midterm election coming up in November 2022. All, all, all the pronosticators, all, th I would say throw, throw your iPads out the window. And this is a ground fight. This is a messaging fight and a ground fight. This is the first midterm election that's taken place after an attempted insurrection since 1866, the year after the Civil War ended. This is not a typical midterm election. This is different. So all these pronosticators, and I, I know some of the commentators, uh, Black News Channel, and I see some of them on MSNBC, some of them with co-panelists on Roland Martin Unfiltered. I don't, I don't, I don't buy into that. Oh, well, it, it's not, it's not ordained. It's not preordained that Republicans are going to take back control of the House of Representatives after you had 147 Republicans vote not to certify the 2020 presidential election results. And, 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 and some of them incited, helped to incite the insurrection. This is this is a different midterm election. So what we have to do is strategize and fight for our own interests and vote those traitors out of office. Because all you got to do is go to congress.gov. This is very simple. This is very simple. All you have to do is go to congress.gov and all these bills that everybody says that they're, that they're interested in, that they want and all this stuff. Okay. John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Most of the Republicans in the House of Representatives voted against the bill. All, the, all, all these bills, you can go to uh, congress.gov and you can look up the bill. You can read a, uh, a uh, summary of the bill and you can see who voted for the bill at congress.gov. Now, you can only vote for your member of the House when it comes to federal elections. You can only vote for your member of the House of Representatives and, and your two U.S. senators. OK. So if you if I live in Detroit, Michigan. I can't vote in Arizona. Or West Virginia. I can't vote Joe Manchin or Chris. Uh, uh, Kirsten Cinema out of office, and they're not even up for re-election to 2024. So, what I think is important for people to do is go to Congress.gov and all these bills that people say that they're interested in: the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, the American Rescue Plan that no Republicans in the House or Senate voted for, the American Rescue Plan that passed in March of. 2021 go look at these bills and go look and see if your member of the house of representatives and your two u.s senators voted for these bills if it passed the senate now the john lewis voting rights act passed the house of representatives august of 2021 by a vote of um 219 to 211 okay let me see this is uh okay i want the one 2021 Introduce uh, corn. Let me see. Can we get? Let's go to all actions. Is this the right one? Okay, 117th Congress. Yep, we're in the 117th Congress. Um, all actions. House. Okay, introduced by the House. Referred. House committee bill history. Let me see. It should show um because that passed in okay, introduced March eleventh, twenty twenty one. And the Constitution Authority, CBO, CBO, Congressional Budget Office. Uh, 
co okay, co-sponsors. Okay, so it shows the co-sponsors for it. Regional co-sponsor. But it should show, because um, that passed the House in August of 2021. Related bills, January 27th. Okay, no related bills section. I have to look for, okay, voting rights. I have to look for the part that I want, but let me try this one more time. John Lewis Voting Rights Act. But it would tell you uh, who voted for the bill. So you can look and see past house. This is what I want right here. Past the house. Okay. Represent. Yeah. Sponsor representative, uh, Terry Sewell, Democrat of Alabama. This is what I want right here. It passed the house. That's right. HR four. Let's look at this HR four. Okay. Passed the house of representatives. It died in the Senate. Okay. No, uh, the only Republican in the Senate that voted for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act was Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alabama. All the other Republicans, the, uh, the 16 sitting Republicans who voted to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act in 2006 and did not vote for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, including Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell in 2006 voted to reauthorize the 1965 Voting Rights Act. He voted against John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and he voted against the Freedom to Vote Act, which uh, Joe Manchin wrote the majority of the Freedom to Vote Act. Okay, so the uh, HR 4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, okay, uh, this passed the House of Representatives, and you can scroll down. This is congress.gov. Very, very important website. A lot of these people as you watch on social media are not going to tell you about this because they don't even know it exists. Um, you can go and you can look and see who voted for the bill, which is which is the most important thing because it's not what you it's not what you say, it's what you do. Okay, show me show me what you support by what you vote for, because Mitch McConnell posted on social media praising Dr. King on Dr. King Day on, on Monday, January 17th. Then on Wednesday, January 19th, when the vote took place on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and, and the uh, Freedom to Vote Act, he voted he voted against those bills. After, after praising Dr. King on Monday, he voted against Dr. King and John Lewis on Wednesday. So let me see here. Yeah, it passed August. It passed the House of Representatives August 24th, 2021. Now I want, if we go to all actions, because I want to go to the part where you can roll call, roll call votes. Let's go to House roll call. Let me see, is it right here? I want to go and I want to look and see who actually voted for the bill. Okay, that's House Committee. So I want to look at the uh, actual vote. Okay, uh, actions overview. Let's look at actions overview. Where is this passage to? Oh, okay, right here. Passage uh, two nineteen to two twelve. Okay, it's two nineteen to two twelve. The vote roll call. I think this is it right here. Okay, two nineteen to two twelve. Yays and nays. Let's go to the next page. Passed. Okay. So, so it shows 219 Democrats voted for the bill. Where is it? Party Democrat. Yay. 219 Democrats voted for the bill. 
one didn't vote. No Republicans voted for the bill. No Republicans voted for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act in the House of Representatives. Now, they'll 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 talk about John Lewis and they'll praise John Lewis during African American History Month and 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 during Dr. King Day, they'll praise John Lewis and tweet about John Lewis and all this stuff. But when it came time to vote, when it came time for Republicans to vote for the John Lewis Voting Rights and Advancement Act, 212 voted no. No Republicans voted for the bill. So you can go to congress.gov and you can like do real research because you can see if, and it breaks it down by the member. This is what I want right here. It breaks it down by the member. Don't, I don't care what your commercial says. I want to know how you vote and how you vote on our interests. So you can go to congress.gov and you can look up these bills and then it shows you everybody who voted for the bill. Okay, North Carolina, Representative Adams voted yes. Uh, Alabama, Representative Adderhalt voted no. If your member of the House of Representatives keeps voting against bills that you advocate for, why would you let them stay in office and vote against your own interests and your taxpayer dollars pay their salaries? Representative Colin Allred of Texas African-American man used to play uh, used to play in the NFL. He voted yes for the John Lewis Voting Rights and Advancement Act. He was ready to throw down on January 6th when the insurrectionists were about to come into the House chambers. He was there with Representative Hakeem Jeffries. They were taking off their cufflinks, taking off their ties. They said they were going to fight. They, they weren't going down without a fight. And then when bills go to the Senate, you can then also look at each one of these bills and see how your two members of the U.S. Senate vote for the bills. So if your member of the House of Representatives keeps voting for so so um, uh, Brenda Lawrence is, is retiring at the end of this. Uh, uh, she's retiring at the end of this um, uh, session at the end of this term. Brenda Lawrence voted yes. I already know that. Ben and Lois, 14th Congressional District uh, from um, Michigan. Represent, she represents Detroit. If your member of the House of Representatives keeps voting for bills that you advocate for, why the hell would you let them get voted out of office? Because most likely the person that's going to replace them is going to vote against your own interests. If your member of the House of Representatives keeps voting against bills you advocate for, why would you let them stay in office? Why wouldn't you vote them out of office? How you see it takes 218 votes to get any bill passed in the House of Representatives. And it takes 60 votes for most bills to get passed in the Senate. 51 of it's being passed through the budget reconciliation process, like the American Rescue Plan. This is simple math. This is simple math in understanding how to get bills passed and vote in your own interests. This is, this is very basic. So we have to have enough intelligence to vote our own interests. When you look at the, when you look at the George Floyd justice and policing act, only people that voted for that bill are Democrats. All the Republicans voted against the bill after they sat up there and cried about uh, George Floyd and, and talked about how wrong it was, what happened to him. That bill passed March 3rd, passed the House of Representatives March 3rd, 2021 by a vote of 220 to 212. All the Republicans voted against the bill. So if you're in a district, if you're in a congressional district and you're a member of the House of Representatives is a Republican, most likely all these bills you care about, they voted against. Why the hell would you let them stay in office? This is not about political parties, it's about policies. If you if you if you if 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 you have a Republican that's you, that is your member of the House of Representatives and they keep voting for bills you advocate for, and you vote them back in the office, that makes sense. But guess what? They keep voting against our own interests. 
the one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan. They had forty six and a half billion dollars in rental assistance for renters and, and landlords They had money for schools to pay for ventilation so they can open back up because African-American children are falling further and further behind during the pandemic, things like this. That one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan. They had another round of money for um, for uh, businesses, the PPP uh, uh, loans for businesses. And you have Republicans who are touting the benefits of that bill. But no Republicans in the House or Senate voted for the bill. So this is just this is just basic. All right. So go to Congress.gov, do more research. This is like basic like schoolhouse rock. I'm a bill on Capitol Hill. OK, I, I want to know how you vote. You can you can look up H.R. 40 reparations bill. Only people that support that bill are Democrats. It originated in the House of Representatives It's still in the House. The last time I checked, it has 190 co-sponsors. It takes 218 votes to, to pass the bill. No Republicans support the bill. No Republicans support the bill. You do the math. And you're going to let them get back in office and take back control of the House and take back control of the Senate. And they keep voting against our own interests. That doesn't even make sense. You can't sit up and talk about Kuji Chagalia self-determination for seven days during Kwanzaa and be a Negro the rest of the year. That that's, that, that's not even logical. All right. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We're here six days a week. The sisters keep uh, stay on the air, keep doing the research, uh, pay the bills, all this. See, this, see, I, I, all that theory, all that BS, I don't deal with none of that stuff. We deal with like practical things. One, two, three. How do we bring this stuff into fruition? Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. The, all the, the, U.S. House of Representatives, U.S. Senate, federal court, federal appeals court, U.S. Supreme Court, U.S. Constitution, all that stuff is connected. I'm, for, I'm all for economic empowerment, but politics shapes the economy. The economy shapes your business and, and the economy shapes the, the environment that your business operates within. I taught entrepreneurship for seven years. You can't. I, I know this in and out. I managed African-American companies where we had government contracts with the city of Detroit, County of Wayne, and the state of Michigan. I ain't talking about theory. I'm talking about what I've done. Okay, there's a whole lot of people talking about theory. Run that on somebody else. Um, this is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the AHN show. Through Cash App, when you go to it, it says Michael. Shows my picture there. These other ones are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. I'm all for economic empowerment. Politics impacts your business. Zoning laws, business permits, uh, health inspectors, uh, building and safety inspectors, government contracts, inflation, supply chain management. All that is tied to politics. OK, getting loans from banks, federal interest rates, PPP loans. All that is tied to politics. So I'm all for economic empowerment. But you have to vote the right people in the office who will pass the proper policies that will be favorable to the economy and favorable to your business. People act like businesses just exist without customers. You need customers that have money to spend with your business. Otherwise, you're going to have to get a job next to them in their cubicle. All that's shaped by the economy. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. All right. So you can register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, we do those on Saturdays and Sundays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, Sundays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. 
2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. We have a special bundle pack right now. You can register for both classes for only seventy dollars. That's going to that's only going for a couple more, a few more days. Um, and even after the classes are over with, you can register. You can still go back and watch the full ten week class. Okay. And let me post the uh, other link here. And then also we have. Uh, African American History Month is coming up. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, email me at AHN show at African History Network.com, AHN show at African History Network.com. But at our website, we have the um, uh, Michael M. Hotel 15 DVD uh, bundle pack, also 15 of my lectures, um, all different aspects of history. And it also includes um, about a three hour presentation I did dealing with the history of African American History Month and dispelling myths about our history. Also, this right here is right on the home page of our website, Michael M. Hotel Black History Month 15 DVD bundle pack. This bundle pack will keep you busy. It's on sale $100. This will keep you busy. It's a ton of information in it and includes three of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther also. So we'll post this link here as well. Uh, and you get um, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization uh, with it also. Uh, you get uh, uh, a lecture that I did dealing with uh, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. Um, you get all that uh, in that one, um, in that uh, bundle pack. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Follow the story Skeeter Hawk as attorney Ben Brooks rediscovers his Gullah Geechee heritage and finds romance along the Gullah Trail and the Sea Islands. Jilted by his fiance who refused to marry him, Ben Brooks goes back home to Gullah country. There, the Gullah people come to call him Skeeter Hawk. While rediscovering his heritage, Skeeter Hawk unravels dark family secrets. A beautiful childhood friend, Fulla, becomes his guide as they travel the Gullah Trail from North Carolina to the Sea Islands in South Carolina in search of more answers. Ben Brooks falls in love with her and becomes torn between her and his former fiance who wants to rekindle their romance. He also deals with a premonition that one of his enemies is pursuing him, providing a backdrop for mystery, romance, intrigue, and suspense in this page-turning novel called Skeeter Hawk from author Sabby Stone. Order your copy today at SabbyStone.com. That's S-A-B-Y, SabbyStone.com. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. 
that's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. iRedify is a Black-owned digital platform that showcases Black and Brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. What does self care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Come and travel with me to a time long ago and place far away. You will experience high adventure and excitement. You are fighting alongside an ancient army in fierce battle. Feel the exhilaration of struggle and final conquest. My name is Maninkare and I am both a prince and a priest in one of the most advanced civilizations humans have ever produced. I want you to ride with me in my chariot as I slay the barbarians who have come to invade my land. I invite you to sit at the conference table with the great Pharaoh Taharqa and his ministers as they plan intrigue and use subterfuge to outmaneuver and defeat the enemy. Come back with me to the land of your ancestors, to the beautiful land of Kemet. So open the pages of this book and begin the adventure. Find out what happens in the book Maninkare Battles the Assyrians in the Nile Valley from author Makari Jones. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. iRedify is a black owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African American authors. Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Soul in Motion, celebrating 38 years in the arts. This energetic ensemble of dancers and drummers was started by percussionist Michael Friend and is led by choreographer, associate director Pam Lassiter. 
Based in the Washington, D.C. area, Soul in Motion is now accepting bookings for Black History Month, Juneteenth, and summer festivals in 2022. Soul in Motion is also available for more intimate events like naming ceremonies and weddings. To find out more or book your date, call 240-452-1349 or send an email to info at soulinmotion.org. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Soul in Motion, celebrating our history, our culture, our future. Soul in Motion, theater, African dance, and drumming since 1984. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our stories, our way.